beginning a new series today that's leading us to that greatest, wonderful uh, day. It's called the, the Path to the Cross, and I want to talk about that. And uh, high five your neighbor, really good, wake them up and tell them spring forward. I wonder if I should have got triple cappuccinos for everyone. Yeah, I was having a conversation with Dan in the prayer. I don't know where Dan went, but it's like, isn't it strange that you, the night before when spring forward happens, it's like, you know, I was trying to get to bed early, but then, and did pretty good, but then when you hit your clock and you fast forward it, then it's not really that early. Are you feeling me? And so I don't know if I went to bed kind of early or late or we got in there pretty good. But you have to be very intentional about that on Spring Ford. I don't know exactly why we do that. I kind of know because of bus picking up kids in the dark and they want to change. I, I get that. Um, amen. Spring Ford. <laughs> Spring Ford. Uh, let's pray. We're going to dive into the word uh, this morning, the path to the cross. We're going to talk about three areas, and I, I hope you catch the spirit of uh, this, this series as we enter into uh, that beautiful, uh, most precious uh, holiday, Resurrection Sunday. We're going to talk about three different areas of the path of the cross. One is preparation. We're going to talk about that today, Jesus' preparation to the cross. And then we're going to also talk about the purpose Next week, you're going to hear a purpose of the cross, the, the pathway of the cross. And then the final week, uh, the passion. And so uh, that final week going into uh, Resurrection Weekend, we're going to have special times of prayer here, and you're going to get the schedule to all that. I don't know if you received this as you came in, but uh, it would be great if you were to take some of these. This is our little card just inviting folks uh, to Resurrection Sunday that weekend. Our, our dates are a little different because we're going we're gonna to have a gathering on Friday night, Good Friday, and then Saturday night, and then both services Sunday morning, but not Sunday night uh, because of Good Friday, okay? So uh, I, I just think if you could just invite some folks, just imagine inviting someone and it changing their life for eternity. Isn't that a worth your invitation? Yes. Yes. Isn't it worth not being fearful, but in inviting someone that could absolutely affect, affect their life for eternity? I mean, it's just a wonderful thing. And, you know, a lot of people, I think, sometimes they'll come if you just, hey, uh, you can come and sit with me or, uh, you know, come one time or just, just being real with them to, to invite them to see what this Christianity is all about. And so uh, the, the theme this year is death uh, was arrested, and it absolutely was arrested. And so if you want to pick up some of those, uh, we're going to be in the newspaper and stuff like that, but just it's probably one of the greatest ways to, in, to, to get people to actually come is a personal invitation. Amen? Preparation, say that with me, preparation. preparation. Father, we just thank you for this time and just ask God that you would just move by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray special blessing over our, our guests today. Father, those on Facebook, we ask, what's amazing, God, is that you're omnipresent. Father, you're everywhere at all times, and we ask it, uh, just a special touch on everyone coming in, uh, Facebook Live, and, and you're also here. Two or more are gathered, the principal presence of God. You're right here in our midst right now. Let faith arise in our heart. Help us to hear your voice today. Change us, challenge us. We love you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. some people prepare better than others in life for different, you know, large events or what have you. And uh, me, not so much. I'm not a very good preparer for certain events. I don't know if I'm missing a chip or what have you. For example, let me give you an example. My wife was really good at preparing Seth to go to college. And it wasn't like it was a long ways away, but it was in Spokane, Whitworth, and just an amazing story behind that. But she prepared for him to go to college and prepared her heart and emotions and stuff like that. And I'm like, I'm just, you know, let's just take him to college. 
And then we take him over there, unload, uh, and then what happens to daddy on the way back is that I'm just, I'm just crying all up in my car. You know, it's like I took him to Mississippi or something, you know. <laughs> it's only 37 miles away, but I'm weeping and see, I, I don't do a, uh, I, don't, I don't prepare well for great events. And then, uh, uh, then you have my daughter getting married. Now, I love Topher, so separate Topher out of this just for a minute because it's not about Topher. You know, this whole thing about ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, don't look at it as you're uh, uh, losing someone. Look at it as that you're gaining someone. And I'm like, you know, I don't buy it. I don't buy that completely. I don't buy that completely. Not when you're driving your truck, your daughter asks you, would you, would you help me take my stuff over to Topher's house? They're getting married. The following day, right? And I'm driving down the, 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 the you know, right out here on, uh, uh, what's the name of the road? 95. <laughs> and we get here about Fred Meyer. I can't hardly see because I'm, I'm crying so hard and we're taking all of her stuff. And I'm like, this does not feel like I'm gaining a son-in-law. <laughs> now, I know that I did. I know that I did, Topher. Don't take it personal. Topher's an amazing son. But I wasn't prepared at all for that. We got to Topher's house and, you know, I think, wasn't we thinking nobody was going to be there? And his family was there. And I'm like, now just red-eyed, I come in with sunglasses on. I'm like, I don't want to talk to anybody right now. <laughs> and it was crazy awkward because... I was not prepared, and Radim was prepared. Well, God has done something, and he prepared Jesus way before the world began as a sacrifice and a ransom for every one of us. And let me tell you something this morning. God is a great preparer. Look at 1 Peter 1.20 with me this morning. It's going to be behind me. Look what it says. God chose him, that's Jesus, as your ransom. Somebody say, prepared. Come on, this is what I'm talking about today. The preparation of Jesus Christ for, for you and I, for, for everyone in this room and everybody that we're going to come across. It wasn't just when Jesus was born of a virgin, even though we're going to get to that. It was way before that time. God prepared uh, Jesus before even creation. It says, God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he has revealed for your sake. Jesus was prepared before the world ever began. I want you to look at Genesis 1.26 with me this morning. If you got your Bible turned there, it's going to be behind me. But uh, you can just flow with me. I think it's good for you to see the word. I think it's beautiful for you to look up the word also, even though you can cheat with the sky Bible. Genesis 1.26, the very, very beginning of that scripture says this. Then God said, look, look, make us, capital U, capital U, capital U. Somebody say us. It didn't say make them or make, it, it says, it says, look, look, look what it says. Let us, it doesn't say let them, it says let us make man in our, there you go again, our, say that with me, our, capital O, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. He didn't say in my likeness. He said in our likeness. Why? Because there was somebody there in that moment. Somebody say Jesus. It's not like Jesus all of a sudden just showed up. God, Jesus has always been. It goes on to say in John 1, 1 through 3, look at what it says. It says, in the beginning was the word, capital W. And the word was with God. You see that? Who do you think the word is? Come on, somebody say Jesus. Jesus. You got to get that in your guts today. Jesus is the word, was the word. Look what it says. It says, and the word was with God. 
He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, capital H, and without him, nothing was made that was made. We see even in the very beginning, the beautiful, mysterious trinity in the big beginning of creation. It's wonderful. It's not like the trinity was just there when Jesus was water baptized. You'll see this beautiful, mysterious trinity throughout all the Bible, and if you get the, if you try to figure out the Trinity, guess what? It's not a mystery any longer, so therefore you ain't going to figure it out. Everyone say mystery. You're not going to figure it out, but it's wonderful, and you see it sprinkled throughout the Bible. Deuteronomy says this, 6-4. Let me challenge you with this. It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay, how does that, how does that work, the Lord our God is one, and Trinity, and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought about what God thought one was? Have you ever thought about maybe how God defines one? Maybe you don't define it exactly like you and I define it. Two people, they get married. The man leaves his mom and dad. They join together. They become what? One? One? What? What? One flesh, right? Once again, a mystery. Because I'm standing here, my beautiful wife is sitting right there, and nevertheless, we're one flesh. Are you with me this morning? Can can somebody say mystery? Look at the definition just for a minute of one. I I love it because it says uh, numeral from 258 properly. The very first word in the definition is united. I'm thinking Wow. And, it, and absolutely, it goes on to say one, or as in ordinal first, a alike, alone, altogether. My, purpose, my, my point here is this. Jesus has been being prepared from the very beginning of time before the world began. Jesus was being prepared for you and I. Let me back up to Genesis 3, 1 through 9. If you're already there in Genesis, just look at this. Everyone say one. Good. Now, the serpent was more cunning. It's not going to be on the Sky Bible. That's why you really, I just really highly recommend you bring your Bible. Amen. Good preaching, J.O. Say this with me. I should bring my Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. Basic instruction before leaving earth, the most powerful thing in the universe, the Bible. Yeah, you should always pack it. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, has already just deceiving, manipulating. He says to the woman, has God indeed said, you are not to eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, Why, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And look, from the very, very, very beginning, you want to know how the enemy gets all in your grill and in your heart and confuse your life and try to get you off track and jack up your life? It's very simple. He's a liar. The Bible says he's a liar and the father of lies. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing God and evil, lies and deception. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, (laughs) lust of the eyes, pleasant to the eyes, Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. And the tree desirable to make one wise, pride of life. All sin falls under those three categories. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then both of, uh, both of the eyes of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. <laughs> and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And all of a sudden, their face with guilt They're faced with shame, they're faced with sin, and they're faced with death for the very first time. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. Somebody say hid. 
This is a great time for you not to be hidden. This is a wonderful time as we go into this resurrection weekend that you not be hidden as a Christian. This is a wonderful time for believers to be a voice in our community. It's a wonderful time. It's like God just kind of spiritually highlights this time, and pe people are way more uh, acceptable coming to church, et cetera, during this time. Come on, tell, you, tell your neighbor, tell him right now and say, come out of hiding. That one's for free this morning. But, but you just watch it in life when you, you know, it, it, you have to watch it as a believer not to be hidden out. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Where are you? I think that's a good question for us to ask about every day of our life. Where are you? Where am I at today, J.O.? Where are you at, J.O.? Where are you at with your relationship with Christ in other relationships? Where are you at in your preparation for what God has for you? Where are you at today in your life? Where are you at? Are you walking closely with God? Or you, have you come out of hiding? Are you in an uh, intimate relationship with him? Are you just showing up on Sunday and that's kind of like your fix for the week? Where are you? Look at your neighbor one more time, a different neighbor, and say, where are you? Good, good, good. And then... I started thinking, where is Jesus right here? Well, Jesus is right there. And I can just imagine the conversation. Think about it. Adam and Eve just fell for the first time. Shame is entered in. Guilt is sin and now death. And the world, literally all hell, has broken loose. And Jesus is there. And I can just imagine the conversation between God the Father, God the Son. Son, this is not Bible. This is just me. Son, you're made for this moment. Son, you're, you're, you're actually made to die. You see this situation that just took place? Death has entered in. This world now has fallen. You will do something that only you can do, Jesus. Preparation. When all heavens opens and there's 40 days of rain and Noah is challenged to build an ark before that and no one else really listens to Noah and then all the rain hits and every living thing is destroyed and they're on the, the ark for uh, just day after. They're on the ark way more than 40 days and all of a sudden the rain stops, the place dries up. There's a covenant in the sky, the rainbow. Where is Jesus? I want to let you know that Jesus is right there in the preparation. With Abraham and Isaac, and all of a sudden, Abraham has taken his son, his one and only son, and God really challenged him, test him to the utmost to bring his son as a sacrifice. And, of course, it was a beautiful example of what Jesus has done, what God has done. And there was a, a ram in the bush. Where was Jesus during all this time? You got to understand that Jesus was right there. This has been preparation from the very beginning. When uh, uh, Jesus was there in the day of Moses, with even what Seth was talking about, the law and the giving of the law. Do you know that the law was a tutor in order to turn our hearts to Jesus Christ? Jesus was there the entire time, and he was being prepared. God was taken and preparing the spotless lamb who would take away the sins of the entire world. He was there being prepared. Listen to what Galatians 3, 23 through 25 says. It's going to be behind me. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law, look at this, was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under 
a tutor. All of this in preparation, Jesus was being prepared for this glorious, glorious day that we're going to be celebrating really, really, really soon. I don't think, I, I never believed that God was anxiously, you know, at one moment of time looking around the world and going, this place is an absolute mess. Look what men and women have done, and I got to do something anxiously to fix it. No, God has always known He's, he's, he's not bound by time. He's omnipresent. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. And Jesus has been prepared before the uh, time existed, before the world existed. Jesus has always, listen, Jesus has always been the plan. How many of you know that this morning? If you don't, I want you to hear that. Jesus has always been the plan. Jesus was always being prepared. God was uh, getting his, his son ready, this, this holy, uh, uh, sinless son who the Bible says is the way and the truth and the life to get ready. And then we do. We do have this thing, this beautiful, immaculate uh, conception of the virgin birth. But it wasn't just a man that was born, and it wasn't only God that was born. It was Jesus, God-man, that was born in a virgin birth. What's so powerful, one of the most beautiful things about the virgin birth is that you have the seed of God and you have man, and I tell you what, it covers everything. Look what, look what Matthew 1, 23 says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name. Anybody remember his name? Everyone say that with me, Emmanuel. Now say it with me with some not, not, not an hour early church. Kind of just needing a triple cappuccino. Can everyone say Emmanuel? Emmanuel. That, is, that is absolutely wonderful. God with man. That separates us from every cult and world religion that's out there. I tell you, Jesus stepped out of heaven in the form of a man. I'm telling you, that is a deal breaker that God stepped out of heaven and did what only God could do for you and I, Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. God with us. God has always been Jesus God with man, Emmanuel. He is the path. He is the plan. And he was being prepared. How many, now we went from Genesis all the way through a little bit. But, 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 but how about the day when Jesus, it looks more like a day of preparation when Jesus is 12 years old. They had been in Jerusalem. They're coming out of there. Look what takes place. This 12-year-old God boy Jesus, pretty cool, God boy Jesus. We don't look down upon anyone's youth at heart of the city church. I hope you know that by now. From the womb to the tomb, every generation, 70, 80, 90, 100, or maybe 10, 5 years old, God's hand for every generation. We put a lot of emphasis in all generations. And you see Jesus right here at 12 years old. It's so powerful in this preparation. I just want to read this, this portion of Scripture. It says this, Luke 2, 41 through 49. And his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, he went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to be, uh, have been in the company. They went a day's journey. And anybody ever forgot their kids at a movie theater or a grocery store or anything like that? Don't raise your hand. We were youth pastors in Eureka, California, and uh, had this group of young people with us. And you have this one kid in the youth group that you never want to make a mistake because of his mama. His mama. Like mama bear on steroids. I'm driving the church bus, just left this area years ago been on a mission trip, kind of, I, I forgot all that we were doing, and some dude pulls up beside me 
in the car. Well, it was the pastor. I'm pretty sure it was the praise God. I think it was the pastor of the church. Pulls up beside me, and the kid that you never want to leave behind is in his car waving at me. <laughs> I'm like, bro, you got to use the bathroom faster than that. Come on, man. I think he was in the, in the bathroom. You remember that, Ray D? Oh, yeah, you don't forget that kind of stuff. <laughs> Wonderful lady, just not the child you want to leave in the bathroom. <laughs> Boy, Jesus lingered in Jerusalem, and Jehovah's mother did not know it, supposing with him in the company. They went a day's journey and sought him among the relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, how many of you know that God doesn't get lost? Everyone else is lost. Every, every person that you've ever met has been lost. Out of the womb, you're lost. No, you're lost out of the womb. David said it. Born in inequity. And by the way, you don't just aren't born lost. When you finally come to your senses, guess, guess what you do? You choose to sin. So you're born lost and you choose to be lost. So we're absolutely lost. God's the only one that's not lost. And it goes on to say, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. <laughs> So it was, was that after three days they found him in, look, 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 check this out, the temple. How many of you want your 12-year-old son or daughter in the temple? Oh, parents, y'all better wake up this morning. You better wake up. That's exactly where you want your kid. You need to get them to youth church. You need to get them to the young adult conference. You need to get them to the retreat. I'm telling you, that's where you want your kid. That's where lives are changed. And look what it says. And so it was after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both, listen, both listening to them and asking them questions. Pretty cool, huh? Got to wonder what they're asking and what they're talking about. And all who heard him was astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, I want you to hear these words real good this morning. Why did you seek me? Did you know, did you not know that I must, I must must say that with me i must i jesus was called before creation he had a must on his i look, look i must be about my father's business this is what i this is what i was born for this is why I exist. Maybe they were talking in the temple, talking to the elders about the hundreds of prophecies that were made about Jesus. Hundreds. The Bible even says that Jesus was asking questions. Maybe as a man, I don't know. Maybe he didn't know everything as a man. I'm not sure about that. I'm not a theologian. My point is that he asked questions and they discussed this in the temple, and I just think this is amazing. Can someone say preparation? preparation? This was definitely a moment of preparation. I must be about my father's business. He was, he knew he was called to do something that was absolutely amazing. Uh, uh, John 4, 34 says, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Even when he was ministering with the woman at the well, when the disciples came back with food, he talked about food and he said his food was to do the will of the father. He must be ab about his father's business. Preparation. A few years ago, Seth, how old are you now? When he was probably 14 we had this conversation of Seth going through rites of passage. And so we had talked about it, Radine and I and, and Seth. We kind of read this, a portion of this book together. And probably at what, 14, 13, we, we um, had decided mom and dad wanted to tell Seth when he was going to be a man. Not a book. Not some crazy lady. I didn't say every lady's crazy. I just said not a crazy lady. <laughs> not a party. Not the dudes. Mom and dad on this day 
It came through dad because I was out with him. But we want to say, this day, you are a, a man. And so we, we planned this for probably about a year out, didn't we? And went hunting and, and uh, one day gave him a set of binoculars to keep his eyes on Jesus. Another day, a knife to stay sharp in the word of God. One day, he wrote a letter to his wife at 13 years old. We signed, sealed it. I never have read it, but I saw somebody reading it on the day that he got married, his wife. Reading bought him a ticket for that time to spend time with friends. We had letters written to him from other friends that had poured into his life. The day that he killed his first deer, oh, this is a good day. Today you are a man. I want you to know. He asked some good questions. He's like, Dad, do I have, he may not remember this, and he can maybe straighten me out. He might, he was, you know, said, Dad, does that mean that I have all the responsibilities that you have? No, you're a young man. But I want you to know that you're a man today. Can some, somebody say preparation? We need to prepare our children. God wants to prepare us. And God prepared Jesus for the ultimate what we're about to celebrate in just a few years, I mean, a few years, a few weeks. Spring forward, J.O., come on now, spring forward. You're like, he's going to preach a few years? And then there's a time where Jesus, you don't hear a whole lot about Jesus' life through his teen years, through young adult years, and a single man he was a carpenter, you know, his dad was a carpenter. And how many of you know that your occupation will absolutely prepare you for your future? I believe that God used every one of those things that he uh, allowed Jesus to walk through for preparation. But let me start, let me say this. I started thinking about this. Now, those who have kids, now you'll feel me on this. Those who have young kids, you'll feel me way good in a few years. Jesus was 13 at some point, and he never sinned. Are y'all feeling me on that? He was 14. He was 15 and 16. I mean, it was time where he could get his driver's license if they did that back in the day, right? And he didn't sin at 15 and 16. He didn't sin at 17. At 18, he didn't sin. I'm like, wow, you didn't sin at 18. You know exactly, y'all looking at me like owls right now. You know exactly what I'm talking about. He didn't sin at 19. He didn't sin at 20. He didn't even sin at 21. He never sinned. It's pretty amazing. You ever thought about it that way? The years that he went through life never sinning, what are those years about? Preparation. If he had made one mistake at 13 or 15, uh, it wouldn't have worked. But he never sinned. All this, I mean, if you don't sin between the ages of 13 and 21, can someone say miraculous preparation? <laughs> Come on, Jimmy, you know what I'm talking about. Huh, Jeff, Jeff, you know what I'm talking about. Everybody in here, every man, woman, and child, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And then now, he's coming out into his ministry and look what he does. He's never sinned, but look what he does. He goes and gets water baptized. The only, the only human God man never needing water baptized, he goes and gets water baptized. If you don't think you need to be water baptized, I got news for you. You need to be water baptized. If you've not been water baptized, J Pastor Jail, you challenge me? Absolutely. If Jesus was water baptized, you need to be water baptized. Look at what it says. But Jesus answered and said to him, talking to John the Baptist, John the Baptist is trying to talk him out of it. He says, permitted to be so, for this thus is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus was water baptized. Part of the preparation and the path to the cross. Look what Jesus did. He set the stage for every believer after him to do all that is right and just to be an example for every man and woman and child to follow, preparing the way for everyone that will ever follow him. He says, this is a good thing. Permitted to be so, for thus is fitting 
for us to fulfill all righteousness. If you've not been water baptized, I encourage you to do that. Matthew 3, 16 through 17. Look, the glorious thing that took place. Another point of the Trinity, when he had baptized, Jesus came immediately from the water. If you come up out of the water, guess where you've been? You've been in the water. Dan, I'm not sprinkling your head. Okay, is that okay if I pick on you, Dan? You're going to go under the water because Jesus went under the water because immediately he came out of the water. Are you following me? And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending in him, a dove and alighting on him. Oh, Spirit of God, bam. And suddenly a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son who I am well pleased. Don't, don't check out on me at this point. It's not what you do that makes you right with God. It's not that you be a performer or your giftings or your work. Jesus had not done anything supernatural at this point. He was God's son. You are his sons and daughters. And he would even speak that over your life. You're my beloved son or daughter who I am well pleased You're not well-pleasing because of your performance. You're well-pleasing because of who you are. You're his son or you're his daughter today. Amen? For the sake of time, I can't go through the rest of my notes. Let me highlight them. And then he goes through the wilderness. Fill me on this. He's led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness. I think that you might put that in your theological pipe and puff it a little bit because he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. The devil didn't lead him. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. What did the devil challenge him on? Listen, he challenged him right from the get-go on his identity. If you are the son of God, I want to tell you right now, the devil, if he can sneak in there and plant seeds and lies of your identity that that you aren't a son or a daughter, I'm telling you, he knows how to wreck lives. If you're the son of God, turn these rocks into bread. He challenged him on his identity. Then he takes him to a high place. Hey, if you're the son of God, throw yourself off of here. Come on, you need to read it. Because what is it challenge? His identity and God, are you really good? If I was to do that, would you really save me? Now, Jesus knew better than he didn't test God, but he challenged, he challenged him in the area of identity. And if God is good, you have to, you have to, you got to seal that in your life of who you are and that God is good all the time. We had a, we had a, we had a precious loss in our family not too long ago. And I, I got it, I think I got in my truck and all I did driving was, God, you are good. I didn't feel like that. But I know that because I walk by faith and not by sight. I do not walk by my feelings. I walk by faith and I just, God, you're good. God, you're good. I got to get this declaration out of my mouth and out of my heart because of this loss. You are good. The devil will challenge you. He will test you in that area. He's, he was being tested here because God was preparing him for what he would be faced with. Are you following me? And then you follow Jesus and he raises up 12 disciples. I'm going to tell you right now, you raise up 12, you know, knuckleheads. You will, I, don't be thinking all oh, St. Peter. All St. John, all St. Come on, man. They were the dirty dozen. And he raised them up. Was he not prepared in raising up these 12 guys? And then you see him in, listen, the woods right before his death. And he's like, God, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. You don't think Jesus ever got stressed? I got news for you. You haven't read the Bible. He was stressed out, distressed. Take this cup, not my will, but your will be done. Wow. Preparation. Preparation for the cross. Preparation for you and I. And here he is at the cross. We're going to talk about this more so over the weekend of Easter. But what he went through 
to destroy sin and death. But Jesus was always being prepared for this moment that we celebrate. Jesus uses everything in your life to prepare you for the destiny he has for you. Through the storms, through the good, through the bad, through the ugly, through the tribulations, through the tests, through the wilderness, through the deserts, he's preparing you. Amen.